You know, there's been a lot of talk recently in the news about Johnny Depp suing his former wife, Amber Heard. Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, $50 million defamation trial. About six years ago, Ms. Heard made some quite heinous and disturbing criminal acts against me. Amber has a need for conflict and wants to place herself in the center of attention. She walked up to me and reached and grabbed the, the bottle of vodka and then just uh, kind of stood back and then this is just, I mean, the whole thing is kind of like a train wreck. Yeah, you can't stop but just watch because you want to see every captivating fact that comes in. The actor said he used his severed finger to write on the walls in his own blood. My family, my friends, everyone train? around me saw all the bruises and the missing chunks of hair, the split lip, the black eye, the swollen nose. Johnny's doing a good job establishing that Amber Heard was the dominant aggressor, that she had a need for conflict. I'm scared to death. I'm frightened, and I don't know what to do. I'm confused, and I want to go home. Oh, hi there. Hello, hello, hi. It's my face again. Swoop, 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 swoop. Hi, good to see you again. If you are seeing me for the first time, hi, welcome. I make documentaries and short films on unsolved cases, true crime, and social media influencers who abuse their power and manipulate audiences because as I always say, it's not drama. It's dangerous. Uh, we also dig deeper into the root psychology and sometimes, okay, child, sometimes we gotta take it to Petty University, okay? Here she is, all her glory. Because as I always say, Petty, Petty is my love language and I am feeling the love today. <laughs> Oh, and speaking of Petty, y'all just, I am so excited. The brand new spring summer Petty University apparel launch is happening very, very soon. Y'all, the designs for this collection are so good. Y'all are gonna love it. I cannot wait. So get ready for Petty, my friends. <laughs> Now we are gonna try something new today. So y'all know that my docs are typically like very heavily researched deep dives. I have like tons of clips and articles in production, but in order to do all that, it takes time, child. Which then like usually means that I can't put out a documentary on something right as it's happening because I'm still in the research phase. But a grillion of you requested that I cover the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. And I thought like, like I gotta do tons of research. It's going to take a while. So why not do some of that research? with you. So we're gonna react in real time to some of the most ridiculous, awful, shocking moments from this well-dressed fiasco. And honey, the trial has been just, she shit on the bed, people, okay? Like a booty burrito tucked in the sheets in the bed. Like that's just a special kind of up. I don't even, I don't even know what to say to that. Okay, we're gonna dive into this intense story, but real quick, a huge thank you to today's sponsor, ExpressVPN, which is kind of like an amazing magic potion for unlocking way more movies and shows on all of your streaming accounts. Question, are y'all still watching Netflix, Hulu, YouTube, or any streaming service without a VPN? Honey, you are missing out on so many more movies and shows. Let me help you out, boo, okay? Basically, when you do anything online, all of your activity is tracked through your IP address, which is attached to the country you're in, and so Streaming services all have restrictions on what shows you're able to watch based on your country. And here in the US alone, there are tons of restrictions. But when I turn on ExpressVPN, I can take my IP address and switch it to another country so that I can instantly unlock tons more movies and shows. Like, did y'all know that South Korea's Netflix has twice as many Oscar winning films, honey? <laughs> and now you can instantly watch them all with the tap of a button. Honestly, y'all, like watching Netflix or YouTube without ExpressVPN is like going to an all you can eat buffet, but you can only eat the celery. Like, why would you, why would you limit yourself? And also, ExpressVPN encrypts 100% of your data. So anytime you're online, no one can see what you're doing, which keeps your personal info secure. Okay, mind your business. And it also means that, you know, like if you Google dog treats one time, you won't suddenly get blasted with like every dog treat ad on the planet for the next month. So to find out how you can get three months of ExpressVPN for free, that's three months watching a million new movies and shows for free, honey, visit expressvpn.com slash swoop or tap the link in the description box and enjoy yourself. Okay, back to the doc. 
Okay, we are gonna jump in with some of the most alarming moments of Johnny Depp's testimony. A and just so we're clear, I am not a news channel. Like, I will have my own opinions. Now, my opinion could change. She hasn't testified yet, and I'm trying to be very careful about wrongly discrediting a victim. And therefore, if we default to just believing Amber, that invalidates Johnny, who is a man, and not believing male victims is also a issue and a problem. Like, bitch, it is complex, okay? <laughs> Johnny, tell them Johnny Depp. I'm Johnny Depp. Yes, I'm, I'm a victim of domestic Can you please tell the jury why you're here today? Um, yes. Um, about six years ago. Oh, okay, he talks so slow. Like, I do think that he's being really calculated with his words, and I don't know if he just kind of talks that way naturally. I think it's a little exaggerated here, which is probably understandable, right? He's got like a bazillions of dollars are at stake here. It's almost painful how slow he speaks, so what I went ahead and did is cut out a lot of the gaps. Uh, Ms. Hurd made uh, some quite heinous and um, these disturbing criminal um, acts that were not based in any species of truth. I think it's really interesting, like when you see him turning and like looking to the side and making eye contact, he's looking at the jury. And so it's interesting the times that he chooses to connect with the jury when he's saying things like, you know, Amber wasn't telling the truth and what that, it's like he's really trying to sell it with that personal connection. And then other times he'll get really small and like he never looks at the jury at all. So I always find that fascinating to think about why. But never did I myself reach the point of um striking Miss Heard in any way. I felt it my responsibility to uh, to stand up not only for myself um, in that instance, but stand up for my children. I wanted to clear uh, my children uh. of, of this horrid thing that they uh. were having to read about their father that was, which was untrue. All right, the very first thing out of his mouth, essentially, he brings up his children. And of course, that would add some sympathy to his side, right? Like he's reminding the jury, if they didn't know, that he has children and that this isn't necessarily just about him and clearing his name, but it's about his children and protecting his children. It's projecting this, I'm such a good father. I wanna look out for my children, which I think is, I think it's true. I think he really does uh, love his children. I don't have like reason to question that, but it, it's an interesting like, is it manipulative? Is it not? It's not, but it is, but it's not, but it is. You know what I mean? I'm obsessed with the truth. He's laying the foundation right there that he is after the truth and that what Amber said is absolutely not true and that he's here to protect his children and to get to the truth, which he is obsessed with that. It's an interesting, really interesting tactic. Bruce had asked me, he said he had been auditioning uh, this this one particular actress named Amber Heard. He said that he'd auditioned her five times, and he was um, he wasn't sure about her capabilities um, as an actress. Uh, uh, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> did Johnny just like backhanded compliment Amber right now? I yeah, I've auditioned her five times, and I just don't know if she's a good actor or not. I don't know about her ability. <laughs> Look at her face. She's just like, Johnny, Johnny, I can't believe you said that. And, I, and so what I said to Mr. Robinson is I said, you've, if you've auditioned her five times, so me putting her, this girl in an uncomfortable situation, I, I, think is a, I, think it's a, I think it's a far better idea. We just meet. Mm, so right there, he kind of created this idea that he was Amber's savior in a way. He opted not to put Amber in an uncomfortable situation by having to do a table read with him. Instead, he was like, what if I just meet her? So he single-handedly kind of like trolled her acting abilities while also becoming her savior to get her the gig. It was a scene where Ms. Heard's character was in a nightclub there was a required a, a requirement for nudity. Uh oh. I was on set the day that they were <laughs> shooting that. Of course. I, as I as I was watching <sighs> the crowd coming in on her, I realized, you know what? Because I would check on 
Ms. Hurd and say, are you all right? Are you sure you're okay? She's supposed to be, I guess, nude at this point, and he's the one checking to see if she's comfortable, if she feels safe, if she's okay. And again, like, if he actually was doing that, then like, good on him, That that's great. But also it's setting up in the jury's mind, like, look, I've been looking out for this woman, like, since the very beginnings. But I realized that with the crowd surging in towards her, we wouldn't have to do the nudity. Telling Ms. Hurd, hey, you don't, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to take your clothes off. Everything's cool. Da, 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 da. Look at him, the savior. And if that's true, then like, <laughs> applause, right? Like, good for Johnny for like taking the initiative to do that. I have no idea if that actually happened. It'll be interesting to see if Amber addresses it in her testimony, but right now he's looking pretty good. It was as if she were, it was, she was too good to be true. She was, attentive, she was loving. So Johnny's talking about the romance phase of the relationship, if you will, right? And he's first getting to know her. If we right now were listening to Johnny's testimony, if we were to believe everything that Johnny is saying, then like that is very common, right? With somebody who then later becomes abusive to change who they are, what they like to kind of suit the, the person that they're interested in, right? He would think, oh, she's like too good to be true. But then slowly uh, in generally in those situations, if they become abusive, you're gonna start to see the interior isn't doesn't matter the exterior and there's gonna be some warning signs and some red flags. There were a couple of things that I don't know stuck in my head that I noticed that I thought might be a little bit of a, a dilemma. Here it comes. And when I would come home from work, um, come in the house or the hotel and she would sit me down on the couch and give me a glass of wine mm -hmm. and uh, take my boots off. I'd never experienced anything like that. The first thing that I think of with that is that it feels like it's conjuring up kind of like the 1930s, 40s, 1950s housewife vibes. The, the husband comes home from a long, hard day of work. The wife is at home all day and she immediately brings him a beer and takes off his shoes, maybe gives him a neck massage. It's like this very 1950s fantasy and it almost feels like She's creating that world for him. And I remember one night I came home from work and, uh, and I think she was on the phone or something. And so I sat down on the couch and I took my boots off. Suddenly Miss Hurd approached with this look on her face that she, and she just said, what did you just do? Oh, he's got a face of concern there. And I think that's him actually recalling this incident. I, I'm, I'm inclined to believe that this happened, but like, let's keep listening. What did you do? So what, what do you mean? You took your boots off. I said, yeah, yes, I did. You, 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 you were busy, you know. No, 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 that's my job. Oh, that's my job. So she's claiming ownership over things that involve his own person. So she's taking kind of ownership, right? If that happened, and I kind of feel like that it did, she's claiming ownership. Oh, you can't take your own shoes off, you grown man. That's my job. And so she gets upset if he does it for himself. A subtle but controlling thing that someone who might be abusive would probably do. But I did take pause, of course, at the fact that she was visibly shaken or upset. She wanted to go to bed. I'd say, oh, well, I, I can't sleep, you know, right now. I, I, you know, I'll just watch, I'll be out here watching TV or hanging out. That was just not acceptable. Mm. As a 50-something-year-old man, was not allowed to go to sleep when I wanted to. And it always does start off with little things like that, little moments of control over someone that you are, without saying it, claiming ownership over, if that actually did happen. Very fascinating stuff here. Okay, now they're gonna get into discussing his substance use and potential abuse. I have thoughts about these types of things being put into evidence. It can very easily be weaponized against someone who may have or currently be dealing with uh, substance use or addiction, um, which is a disease of its own. So I think it can often get out of control and, uh, and not help handled responsibly, but we'll see what they do here. There were many years that I didn't touch a substance and no 
drugs. There were many years that I didn't have a drink. It's never been for the sort of party effect. It's been for trying to numb the things inside that have that that that, that plague that that can plague plague someone. It, it sounds like he is probably frustrated. I think there's been a lot of characterizations about him just being, you know, drunk all the time and like a, a drug user and, and all this kind of stuff. And it sounds like that likely is not accurate. Who's who's experienced trauma? So, and he was saying that he used the drugs to numb as like a numbing agent uh, in response to trauma, which I think he'll get into a little later. I think it was an easy target for her to hit because once you've trusted somebody mm. for a certain amount of years and you've told them all the secrets of your life that information then of course can be used against you yeah there there it is he, he's talking about amber weaponizing his drug use against him when we see amber's side i think they're going to heavily lean into his substance use and his alcohol uh use even though she herself there are wit many witnesses saying that she heavily drank i i am not some maniac who needs to be high or loaded all the time. I oh. Johnny should not have used the word maniac because then that paints the, the picture of someone who's uh, living with active addiction as being a maniac versus someone who is dealing with a disease of addiction, so. I was disappointed in myself. When you are constantly in a position to be harassed by your beloved other mm. what else could i do mm. i i wanted to be numb i didn't mm. want to hear that oh that's that's rough <laughs> that's rough it's going to be difficult i think for amber's side to prove that he was using alcohol or substances as a partying thing and just using it recklessly versus using it as a way to cope with what he alleges to her ongoing abuse to cope with trauma Whew, that one's gonna be sticky so now he's going to talk a little bit about his mother and his father, which I do think is important uh, to lay a foundation for where he might be coming from and how he might be processing things that did or didn't happen with Amber. My mother was quite unpredictable. It become quite violent. An ashtray being flung at you, you know, it hits you in the head or... He does that laugh that like... <sighs> She could be, you know, uh, an ashtray. And they kind of like lifts the corner of his mouth. I think that that's part of Johnny's baseline where he laughs in these moments of extreme trauma. So I think he, that's how he copes with it. Kind of makes it easier for him to process if you just kind of turn it into a joke. You know what I mean? Then you don't maybe feel as much of the pain. I know comedy and jokes is very common for victims of abuse. So I think it's really important to note that here because in times later where where he kind of laughs when he's talking about Amber and the abuse that he's alleging there. He does the same thing that he does when he's talking about his mother. So I do think that those laughs are genuine coping mechanisms. She could become quite violent. An ashtray being flung at you. There it you know, is. You'd get beat with a high heel shoe or it's almost like so absurd to him, you know what I mean? That like somebody would do that to another person that it's just like, it, it's so ridiculous. It's kind of like a joke. We were never exposed to any type of safety. The only thing that one could do um, was to try to stay out of the line of fire. Even if you just walked past, you, you'd, you'd sort of shield yourself because you didn't know what was gonna happen. There it is again. He laughed and smiled through that whole thing and there's not one shred of me that thinks he's making this up. I think this was how he lived every day as a child growing up and I think he just processes it with humor. There was uh, quite a lot of verbal abuse. We had to take it. I mean, you, you, you just mm -hmm. had to take the pain. What about your father? What was he like? He's a very kind man, very quiet man not a confrontational uh, person in any way. I feel like there's a lot of similarities between Johnny and his father. He stood there and just while she delivered the pain and he swallowed it, he took it. To me as a five-year-old boy, I kept thinking to myself, why doesn't he leave her? Mm. But he didn't. You know? um, 
he looked really sad there. <laughs> like, a child should never even have to be processing that thought. Like, why doesn't he leave her? Like, that's not, I don't know, that's really sad. <laughs> Okay, now we're gonna talk about Amber and her friends and Johnny paying for her friends and where they live and child, I can just, I can already feel the petty bubbling up inside. When did you start getting introduced to Miss Heard's friends? Almost immediately, well, in fact, immediately, yeah. She uh, needed a place, so we gave her penthouse four. And how long did she live there for? Uh, uh, on and off for, uh, I suppose, a couple of years. Oh my gosh. How much rent did you charge her? Uh, Johnny, you better say you charged rent. Don't disappoint me, Johnny. Nothing. <laughs> oh, it sounds like immediately one of her Amber's friends moves into one of Johnny's penthouse uh, in downtown LA. I know the building he's talking about. It's a beautiful building. Those are not cheap places. We won't talk about the freeloading bitch, okay? Did Io end up living in that house or just working there? Io is a different person now than the first person they were talking about. No, no, I Io ended up uh, living in the house for somewhere in the neighborhood of a year. Another one of Amber's friends living in one of Johnny's penthouses and let's find out if you charged them rent. And how much rent did you charge to Io? Nothing. They're just dating right now. <laughs> hey, can can my friends just freeload out your wallet? Like, don't you have your own money, sis? Do your friends? Okay. Why did Rocky end up moving into the penthouses? This is a third person. I believe the first person was her sister. Amber had asked if I would be okay with, you know, Rocky moving in. How long did Miss Pennington end up staying in the penthouses? Longer than I did. <laughs> Longer than I did. <laughs> and how much rent did you charge to Miss Pennington? Johnny, do not say zero dollars. Johnny, 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 Johnny. Nothing. Uh -huh. <sighs> did anyone live with Miss Pennington in the penthouses? Her fiance or boyfriend and fiance Josh Drew. Oh man, so Amber had friends living off of Johnny's dime. She had her sister living off of Johnny's dime, who then brought in the boyfriends and the, the fiancés, all living rent free, not just to Johnny's mind, but in his wallet. Okay. I ain't saying she a gold digger, <laughs> but she ain't messing with no broke. <laughs> Okay, now we're gonna get into the meat and the potatoes of uh, some of the abuse allegations. The only ambition that I've ever had in my life arrived the second that my first child arrived. Oh. In the second. Oh. The instant. That's which sweet. Which was to be a good parent, to be a to be a great father. And notice here, he's like rocking back and forth here, which I do my understanding with nonverbal analysis is that is a uh, often a self-soothing gesture to be rocking back and forth. And I've noticed in times when he's talking about like a lot of abuse, he did it with his when he was talking about his mother and his father. I feel like that's a self-soothing, very vulnerable moment for him and things that he's not comfortable talking about. There were several occasions where Miss Heard would. Um, would tell me what a bad father I was, try, trying to spend as much time with my children uh, as possible. Mm. That could send Miss Heard into a, a monumental tailspin, where I could I could hardly ever go and see my kids. Wow, that is so, so, so bad. One of the classic things that an abuser does, someone who's trying to control a relationship, is to isolate them from their support system. Generally, like, gradually over time. It's usually not something like, boom, you can't hang out with anybody the second, you know, they start dating. It's very much like they start getting upset when you're hanging out with your kids today. I thought we were gonna have dinner tonight. Oh, you're taking your daughter, like, to the concert? I thought you were taking me to the concert. You know what I mean? Like you don't notice that it's happening, but then it just starts compounding to where the person gets more and more upset. You know what I mean? It seems innocuous, but it's actually very intrusive and it slowly starts to peel the victim away from their support system. And it sounds like she's doing that with his own children. You're a bad father. You're a terrible father. Mm. One can only take so much of that before bits of your brain, bits of your heart, begin to 
the valve gets shut off. Mm, so he's saying that, you know, in addition to separating him from his own children, she's also then telling him, you're a terrible father, you're a bad father, all of these things that she would know cut to his core. And you know that it's meant as a whip. It's just to, it's to slice you up. It's to bring you down. Yep. It's to demean you. Yeah. It's to bring you into a place where you start to believe that there's something wrong with you. Boom, there's the gaslighting. He starts to believe that he's not a good father. And then of course, if she's taking him away from his children, then he actually is not in his children's life as much as he would want to. And so he might internalize that, not as her causing him to do that, but as him. So maybe I am a bad father. That is the gaslighting, that, oh. Those, those, those facts were used against me. As, as weapons it did not help the relationship. It wasn't meant to help the relationship. It was meant to feed her need for conflict. Mm. She has a need for conflict. She has a need for violence. It erupts out of nowhere. And uh, what I learned, the only thing I learned to do with it is exactly what I did as a child. Mm. Retreat, Ugh. take a step back, which I told her, we need to remove ourselves yeah. from each other, even for an hour, yeah. a day, anything. Oh, that it's so rough because you're hearing him give these accounts where he's trying to escape. And that sounds very much like what his father did, right? He said that his father just took it. Also, knowing that he had intimated things to Amber that he feels like she has weaponized against him, which is a very, very classic tactic for an abuser to use. They gather information from you, find your soft spots, and then when you least expect it, boom, they attack you with it and they attack your soft spots so that they could try to get a rise out of you so that, that they could then create a conflict. Because this, this, this can't go on. No one can live like this, you know. But why did I stay? I stayed, I suppose, because my father stayed. Mm. I, I remember very well that when my father left and my mother, Petty Sue, had uh, that first attempt at suicide, Mm. that I woke up to, and that visual in my head, Ms. Hurd had spoken of suicide on a couple of occasions, so th that also becomes a factor that always lives in the back of your brain. Wow. Oh, there's so much here that I did not know that paints such a picture right now. Again, this is a one-sided picture, but it's so telling. If it's true that Amber threw around the idea that she might hurt herself or kill herself if he leaves her, then that is weaponizing that threat against him in order to force him to stay. And it is a manipulative way to control the victim. Many times when I would try to leave, she would stop me at the elevator with the security guards crying, screaming, I can't live without you. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to die. There were, there were even a couple of times when I did escape and I got to my house and then five minutes later she would arrive and she would arrive in her nightgown screaming. Wow. And this is just him saying like, look, we're having a fight and I need to, I need to leave for right now so that this doesn't get any worse. But he goes to another house of his and she shows up there in the parking lot in her nightgown screaming in the parking lot five minutes later. I mean, that also borders on a uh, kind of stalking behavior, right? And like, wherever you go, there I will be. Like, you will not be able to escape me. It was out of control. It was uncontrollable. Okay, we're gonna take a, a listen to some of the recordings. They recorded each other a lot. It is very strange. I was I was the first uh, person to uh, record. I've been so curious about who started the recording. So now we know that Johnny was the first to start doing it. These demeaning, berating insults. There would be these anything to make me feel small. Mm -hmm. So what I thought was. I'm going to record the conversation. And I told her this. That is really important, by the way. Uh, I know it's different for every state, but they were living in, in California, in Los Angeles. California is a two-party consent state, meaning you cannot record somebody without their knowledge. Uh, both parties have to know that it's happening and agree that it's okay. It was surreal. She had completely denied things she said directly to my face. Then she started recording without saying without telling me that she was recording something okay that's super illegal which is fine but not 
so fine, if you, if you know what I mean. He's like, oh, I have nothing to hide, so it's fine that you record me, but also it feels incredibly violating of my privacy and my person. There was this incident where he was detoxing from substance use, which detoxing, in case y'all don't know, can be a very difficult, very painful experience for somebody. There was a, there was a great part of me that was very uncomfortable with Ms. Heard coming along for that detox because as things could fluctuate very rapidly in our relationship, I was wary that those things would come up during what needed to be a very straight detoxification of, of, of these substances. That makes perfect sense, right? If you have a volatile relationship, I would imagine the last thing someone who's dealing with addiction uh, would want is to potentially have someone getting in an argument with you while you're also detoxing. So then why did Ms. Hurd come down to the island with you during the detox process? She insisted. <laughs> Ding, 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 she insisted, she needs to be there, needs to control things, allegedly. She switched places with uh, Christy. And so the, his sister was originally supposed to come with him to be there to help him through the process. And so Amber insisted that she be the one there. And so she switched places with his sister, which is just, I, I think that's an incredibly selfish thing to do. And Ms. Hurd had made a deal with nurse Debbie and Dr. Kipper uh -oh. to, to stay at their end of the island and that she would administer the drugs, administer the medications that, 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 that I needed to not go into these intense, uh, sharp, painful heebie-jeebies. <gasps> So Amber made a deal to be the one giving him the medication that he needs to get through the detox. Cool. It was a moment when uh, it was coming on very fast and I, and I, I Ms. Heard was at the sort of kitchen area and she was chopping vegetables, I remember. That little detail right there, him saying she was chopping vegetables and him making the chopping motion at the exact same moment, is that is like his brain actually recalling and going through the motions. So I fully believe that this story is real, that it actually happened. I think he's actually tapping into the memories of what happened here. I said to Ms. Heard, uh, I'm gonna need the meds now. She looked at the clock and she said, it's not time. And I said, no, 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 you don't, you don't understand. This is, this is not about clocks and watches and things. I believe that was about the lowest point in my life because I had to say, please, may I have the meds? She was, was adamant. No, it's not time. It's not, not time. Her denying him that medication when he needed it sounds very, not only very controlling, but it sounds cruel. Now, I don't know the finer nuances if there has to be a schedule for the medication and that you can't deviate from that. Being that she's not a doctor, that's very, very alarming to me. When I was begging at that point, tears streaming down my face, begging another human being to please, please give me the meds that will take this away. The only thing that one can do is you go straight to uh, the shower, mm. you put it on scalding, and you stand underneath the scalding shower. Oh my gosh. Essentially, you're burning the top, you know, your skin is burning from the, and what that would do is it would trick the nervous, the nerves away from the receptors because they had now they had an immediate problem that needed to be dealt with. Oh my gosh. She denies him the medicine, so the only thing he can do is get in a scalding hot shower and burn his skin so that his brain receptors are like, oh shit, let's respond to that. And the response being agony, you're being burned to where you forget about the withdrawal because now you're worried about being burned by scalding water. I think that's even more reason why Amber should not have been the one controlling the medicine. It should have been a doctor. I had a conversation with Nurse Debbie and with Dr. Kipper. I told them that she had uh, denied me the 
met, then I told him that I don't think that this is going to work here anymore. I think we have to leave the island. He got Beyonce money, okay? He got a private island. Imagine you fly to a private island where she's not even supposed to be there. You disrupt the entire process so badly that now he has to stop the detox there and fly back to Los Angeles. All of these people fly them all back so that he could do it in Los Angeles. We went back to Los Angeles and then I asked Miss Hurd if she would please allow me five days, seven days, whatever it took to get done with, finished with the rest of this, 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 this horrific detox. And I think it's an interesting word choice. Allow me to get through this withdrawal and this addiction detox. I was immediately accused of throwing her out. Mm -hmm. I was accused of um, abandoning her, not appreciating all that she had done. I begged her, please, can I get a place at the Beverly Hills Hotel? I'll get you and your friends a bungalow where you can all stay together and have a grand old flag. You can have... I'm sorry, did he just say a grand old flag? Is he from the 1920s? Okay, I'm sorry, that's sidebar. Let's continue, Your Honor. Fun, you can do whatever you want, and you don't have to sit around Mr. Uh, Shaky. She wasn't happy about it. He's like, hey, I will pay for a bungalow at the Beverly Hills Hotel, which ain't cheap, bitch, okay? And he's like, I will pay for you and your friends to have a grand old flag. <laughs> Just leave me the fuck alone, bitch. I am trying to get clean for me. I'm trying to get clean for you. I'm trying to just do all the things that bitch you just... And her response is, you're abandoning me. If that's what happened, that is just classic textbook. Her controlling everything about him and his life and his decisions, all at his expense. It's shocking. All right, honey, brace yourself, because now we are going to talk about the finger. What happened when Miss Heard came to visit you in Australia? Ms. Heard was upset because, uh, as it was too late for a prenup agreement, there there was a uh, discussion of postnup. She kept saying, "I'm not even in your will. I'm not even in your will." <laughs> they didn't get a prenup, which is just like. <laughs> Honestly, you don't even have to be a celebrity for me to say, I don't know what you're thinking if you don't get a prenup. But you know, people still have this notion of like, we're never gonna get divorced, so like, what do I need a, a prenup for, okay? That just means like that we doubt the relationship, but it's like, honey, you do know that like 50%, 60% of marriages at this point end in divorce or misery, okay? One of the two. And a lot of times people don't get divorced because they didn't have a prenup. They didn't have anything protecting their own assets as an individual. So therefore the divorce rate would actually be higher if people were protecting their assets Whew. But so it sounds like then after they got married Johnny was like, you know what? Maybe we need to get a post nup So she's like super mad about the whole situation. She kept saying I'm not even in your will I thought that was an odd thing to say. Yep. It felt uh, wrong Yeah, and she could not let go of the fact that I was in on this uh, post nup agreement and that I was trying to trick her into uh, essentially getting nothing if uh, if something were to happen. It escalated and escalated and to, turned into uh, madness. That you know, as she's hammering me, sort of brutal, brutal words, and I'll, I'll just cut to the chase. I, I think that I ended up locking myself in about at, le at least nine bedrooms, bathrooms wow. that day as she was banging on the doors and screaming. I cannot imagine a scenario where you have to constantly hide from your spouse and you're hiding in these rooms trying to get away from them simply to try to avoid having an escalated conflict. I was a mess, I was a wreck, I was shaking and I just didn't understand why. I went behind the bar, I grabbed a bottle of vodka that was there and I poured myself two or three stiff shots of, uh, of the vodka. First taste of alcohol I'd had in a long time. That I think is really important to note because he had said earlier that he only turned to alcohol or to drugs as a numbing agent, a way to escape whatever pain or trauma that he was experiencing. And of course started screaming, oh, you're drinking again, yeah, the monster and all that. She walked up to me and reached and grabbed the, the bottle of vodka, kind of stood back and then hurled it at me it just went right past my head and smashed behind me 
That is so terrifying. But number one, again, remember how I said that he like smiles, right? In like moments of extreme trauma that he's recalling. He smiled with his mother and he smiles here when he's like, it whizzed right by my head and he's like smiling. And I think that that is a genuine emotion that he's showing there. I think that that actually happened and he's recalling it. And it's almost like, this is so absurd. This is so ridiculous to me that I'm laughing to try to process this. Was leaning like this in the chair looking at her first bottle went then got the other bottle shot takes the second bottle which is the larger one do you all know how heavy a bottle of vodka is like that is solid glass even if it's empty solid glass and then it's filled with liquid volume on top of that and that shit is dangerous you could literally take somebody out and then when it's thrown with velocity like that is a serious assault and my my hand is on the edge of the bar like like that you know leaning over the fingers like that, and uh, she threw the large bottle, and it made contact and shattered uh, everywhere. I honestly didn't, I didn't feel the pain at first at all. I felt no pain whatsoever. I felt heat. Ugh. Um, and then I looked down and realized that the, 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 the tip of my finger uh, had been severed. Ugh. I was looking directly at my bones. Oh, oh my gosh. I, oh. The, the, the top of his finger is just cut off. Like, just boom, gone. That's, that's it. And he's looking at his own bones. <laughs> the amount of shock that I would think someone would just instantly go into. I, I don't know what a nervous breakdown feels like but that's probably the closest that I've ever been. I, nothing made sense. But that's, a, that's a good assessment of a nervous breakdown. I don't know how he didn't have a breakdown. I would have just been like, <laughs> so ridiculous, so ridiculous. I started to write with my blood in my own blood. Johnny! On the, on the walls. Johnny! Johnny, 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 Johnny. Who, who, you, you, your finger blew up and you're just like looking at your bones and you're like, okay, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna write with this bloody bitch all over the walls. I'm gonna just put messages in the blood. <laughs> I, I don't know what a nervous breakdown feels like, but that's probably the closest that I've ever been. Can you imagine the chaos in that moment? Mentally, you're so blocked, you're in so much shock that you just like, okay, it's, a sketch bitch okay here we go i got some shit to say you ain't gonna listen so let's put it in writing bitch okay let's put it in writing what if anything did she say when she saw the injury i, I don't recall anything but just uh it was almost like white noise mm. just someone yelling mm -hmm. just a, it was just a high pitched attack Mm. I was in a bit of shock, you know. A bit of shock. I was in a bit of shock. I just painted Picasso with my own blood on the mirrors and shit, but I was in just a bit of shock. Like, he's so modest about this. The doctor asked me what happened, and uh, I lied to him. Mm. I said that I had uh, smashed it in, in these large accordion doors. Why uh, would you lie about that? I, I, didn't want to, I didn't want to disclose that it had been misheard, that it had thrown, the, thrown a vodka bottle at my at me and then took my finger off. Just so, so y'all know, like uh, throwing like even like a water bottle uh, filled with water or something it is in the eyes of the law considered assault with a deadly weapon. So like, let's not minimize the severity of this situation. It is uh, absolutely unacceptable to throw things at somebody, period. But especially bottles, especially glass. I know they're gonna challenge this when Amber's side presents the case. It is very common for a victim of DV to make excuses for the abuser and to lie about it on their behalf because they don't want them to get in trouble. It, it's all part of the trauma bond. It's also oftentimes the victim is afraid if they report uh, the abuser that they, they'll go home to even more rage and more violence. Maybe I caused this. Maybe this is my fault. Maybe I have some shame here. I don't want anyone to know. I don't want to cause any problems. I just want it to go away. I just want to pretend that it didn't happen. I want to get back to normal. He removed all the bandages and he found that, um, 
that my finger was indeed infected and that I had uh, contracted uh, MRSA, which is like a flesh-eating disease or something. It was a pretty grotesque sight, Ms. Heard taking my cigarette and, and um, this is after the finger had gone away and she stubbed it out in my, in, in, in my face, in my, on, on my cheek. Now here's a little clip from the cross examination uh, in regards to the finger. But your testimony is that somehow she wound up with this handle of vodka. If it happened the way you said, it didn't didn't damage any other part of your hand. The middle finger certainly took the brunt of it as the tip. It's such a compelling story that Johnny has. And so what the attorney is doing is what classically people who don't want to believe victims do all the time. And it's like, your fingers are close together and they, the bottle hit it, but only one of them was hurt. If only one of them was hurt, can this be true? It's almost like saying like, if somebody just walks up and like decks somebody straight in the face, right? And their hand hits right on the nose. That would be like somebody be like, so they broke your nose, but like your ears fine. So should we believe it? There's no, there's no record of any glass being found in that middle finger. I'm not a doctor and I'm not sure what, what I do know is that when I went to the emergency room that they had to um, inject me with a block to be able to put it into a bucket and, and take a wire brush to, to scrub it. <laughs> and then you use that finger and you use your you use your finger as a paintbrush, right? Essentially, yes. <gasps> Did you all see Amber smile there when the attorney says you use your finger as a paintbrush? She smiles. Let's watch this again. You use your finger as a paintbrush, right? Essentially, yes. And looks like a smirk or a smile. I don't know. Y'all leave me a comment right now. Let me know what you think about that. Like, what does that mean? Okay, now we're gonna get into a few more examples of what Johnny alleges as far as, far as abuse goes. She didn't get a jump out of me or a jolt out of me. She got out of bed, walked around the bed. So he prefaced the story by saying that he was laying in bed and she was, you know, she's insulting him and she sees that he's not responding. He's just there laying there. And so she gets up and walks over to his side of the bed and I believe actually physically assaults him allegedly. You've got a person who is uh, throwing multiple shots at your, at your face, at your head, at your neck, at your, at anything she could hit. I. I got up out of bed, I grabbed her by the shoulders, sat her down on the bed, mm. and I said, I'm leaving, please don't get off the bed, mm. please don't follow me. And she got up, squared off at me, and I said, what do you, what do you want to do, hit me again? Bam. Wow. And then I just said, did that, is that what you wanted? Would you like another? Wow. Bam. It's the second one. Wow, so he punches him, he motions a punch, and then he's like, do you need to do it again? And punches him again. I said, good, now you're done. Grabbed her by the shoulders, walked her to the bed, sat her down and said, don't follow me. Leave me alone. If his story is true, again, uh, we don't fully know. Someone who needs to control a relationship, especially if they use violence as a form of that control or manipulation, is going to be very angered and probably enraged that no matter what you're doing, the person is still calm and gonna get up and leave. Child, now we're, we gonna have to get to the booty burrito, okay? We gonna have to get to the log, the bump in the road, dropping the kids off at the pool, the cocoa butter biscuit. We go, we go have to go there. I had received some news that was as absurd <laughs> and grotesque. <laughs> this story is, it is so out of the realm of like, like what the f is happening? And then I was shown a picture of what the problem was. It was a photograph of the bed our bed and on my side of the bed was human fecal matter. <laughs> Did you see how he had to look at the jury? He's like, it was human fecal matter. Can you believe this shit? Like, I feel like that was his voice, but it was internal the monologue right there. My initial response to that was, I mean, I laughed. Right, right. I, I, there, 
it was so outside it was so bizarre yeah and so grotesque <laughs> that i could only laugh right mr depp how was your mother's health during this time oh my mom was in the um, cedar sinai hospital she was on her way out oh my gosh his mother she's in the hospital right now and emmer shits on the bed she was dying and what were some of those things that your mother's death opened your eyes to that life is a bird song mm. that what feels like a hundred years is in fact a second wow I decided that i would call amber and tell her that my mom had had died <clears throat> that day I said look i've i've made a decision and i think it's the best thing i'm gonna file for divorce mm. and i thought i figured she understood as well as I did, that, that there was no way back. He has this like realization of source, which people often do in that situation. And so he calls Amber and he's like, look, life is short. I hopefully you agree here that we're both miserable and I'm going to file for divorce. And I think that's the best thing. She brought up the situation of the fecal matter on the bed. <laughs> tried to blame it on the dogs. Why didn't you think it could have been the dogs? They're teacup Yorkies. They, they weigh about four pounds each. I bet the shit weighed more than the dogs do. I'm sorry. None of that did not come from a dog. <sighs> yeah, let's move on. <laughs> So Johnny's talking about a, a, another fight that happened. It was escalating. I think they were arguing about the little shit sandwich that she left in the bed. He had said that she called a friend and they were laughing about it. So what he's saying is he went over and took the phone from her and said, I owe, you know, this friend of hers, you can have her. She's all yours now. And I was walking towards the uh, kitchen to uh, exit and then... Now he does, this was a moment where he starts rubbing his mouth quite a lot. And I have noticed when there were times in cross-examination where he didn't like what the attorney was saying or he didn't want to answer something, you could tell he was deflecting. He would rub his mouth, which from my understanding, again, of some non-verbal, that could suggest that he's physically stopping himself from saying something. Literally bite their tongue, is that's what the expression comes from. Um, and in this instance, he's rubbing his mouth and I feel like he is stopping himself from saying something. I feel like he knows something else happened here that he's not going to share. And so I'm kind of inclined to think that he may have done something in this situation that was not good. Suddenly Rocky ran in. Leave her alone, Johnny, leave her alone. I was 20 feet away. Where was Miss Hurd at that time? She was still sitting on the couch. The screaming started. Stop hitting me, Johnny. She's screaming in her best freaked out, upset voice. So he's saying that he's 20 feet away from her and she's screaming, stop hitting me, which then of course would be the boy that cried wolf, right? He can't be hitting you from 20 feet away. Stop hitting me, stop hitting me. Jerry Judge and Sean Bett entered the room she was quite surprised to see them. She so those are his people. She said, that's the last time you'll ever hit me. That's the last time you'll ever do that to me. And again, I'm, I'm a good 20 feet away by the fridge. That was the last time I saw Miss Heard. It's really interesting, right? I don't know what her testimony is going to be on this, but he is saying that he was across the room when she was accusing him of beating her. Now, do I think he was withholding some information about rubbing the lips like that? Yes, I kind of do. I did find a, uh, when they played a recording between them, uh, a moment where it sounds like Amber is accusing him or, or, or using language that implies that he's being physical in a moment where I think he's very clearly not being. If that is something that she has done, that could be what happened in that scenario that he just talked about. Okay, so let me go and you go and I'll speak to you in a couple hours. Okay? Okay? Why are you saying stop? He's, May he's I so, go? Please, it causes me so much stress when you leave, when you walk away from me with that is like you're you don't understand how much worse you're making this. Again, that is an example of trying to exert control. This is how I want the argument to play out, uh, which then puts him in a position of like, oh shit, I I guess I'm being told I'm making her more distressed. I can't believe this. Please, you're making it worse for me. Okay, I'm sorry for you. You 
causing me immense stress right now when you walk away like that. There's no reason to be mad. Well, I'm... Then say goodbye. I haven't walked away. You're not saying goodbye. You won't let me fucking leave. Let me leave. Oh Stop rushing me. Stop pushing me in the corner and then poking me with a stick and then saying, why are you saying the words you want me to say? Stop poking me. Stop rushing me. Stop throwing me against the wall. I'm going, what? You don't like that wall? You don't like the fucking wall? Stop pushing me. I think she's using phrases, analogies, right? Stop pushing me. Not like physically pushing me, but stop pressuring me, I think is a better word there. But she's saying stop pushing me. And, and what makes me think that there wasn't an instance of like physical violence there is then she uses the expression, stop poking me, right? And I don't think he was there with a stick literally pushing and then poking her. It's just an expression, it's a way of speaking. And then she uses this analogy, what I believe to be an analogy of stop, you know, throwing me against the wall, meaning stop metaphorically cornering me into a wall and then complaining that I don't like the corner that you just metaphorically put me in. I feel trapped, I don't feel like I can express myself. And so that to me could potentially be an indication that she uses words that then somebody, if you're just hearing a recording, might interpret that as an actual physical reference when it's not, which then can put Johnny in a very sticky situation and also make him feel like he's being accused of violence when he's not being. It could be a default setting to her using this type of language when she's describing him to other people to make it sound like he is physically abusive when he might not be. Now, that could also be maybe she has experienced that with him and so she's responding uh, as a victim conjuring up these memories of actually being physically put on a wall but at the same time it sounds like she's using this language to manipulate the situation to make him have to feel like he has to do what she's saying because he doesn't want to be accused of doing physical things that he's not doing I'm rushing you I said I need space I don't want this conversation anymore right now. I need space and I will take my space, whether you like it or not, and you will take your space. So what Johnny is doing, he's trying to establish boundaries, right? Literal boundaries saying, I need to go. But he's also respectful. He says, I will take my space and you will take yours. Well, this is not, bro. This is not happiness. Please this is not. This please is... stop doing this. Please, it causes so much fucking stress. I'm gonna die. This ain't, I'm gonna you're causing me so much stress please stop i feel like i have a heart attack almost every day please stop please then, then stop doing, doing it please stop he's so Stop. I'm looking at their body language, right? And Amber's taking copious notes right now. Again, victims can process things in different ways, so I don't want to hang too much on my, my take on that. But at the same time, she's not reading like somebody who is kind of reliving and experiencing what sounds on the recording like a very intense moment. And Johnny, look at his expression. He's very visibly like troubled by this. He seems like he is reliving something that is painful to him. And this was similar to how she acted in her deposition when she's just eating during like traumatic moments. And it's just like, well, I don't understand why you just eating through these times that you said were very terrifying for you. But again, isn't it true, Ms. Hurd, that in September of 2015, you punched Johnny Depp in the face with a closed fist? Mm. I hit I hit Johnny. Could that be a victim's response to just disassociate? Uh, yes, it could. And then, of course, in the recording, what are the things that she was saying? I'm gonna, I could, I could die. I feel like I'm having a heart attack every time. Please stop, please stop. The thing is, he has stopped. He is simply saying, I need to go. <laughs> that is about as stopped as you can get. And But she keeps saying, please stop, please stop, please stop. And it's kind of like, I don't know what else you want me to stop here. Stop but I'll die if you stop, you know what I mean? And so it's like, well, how is Johnny supposed to move? How is he supposed to operate in a situation like this? You talk about him putting you up against a wall, it kind of feels like you have pushed him into a wall and won't respect the boundaries that he is trying to set so that the two of you don't explode into this big, dramatic, terrible situation. Please, you're killing me with this. You're killing me.
you're killing me, you're killing me by you stopping when I told you to stop, but let's argue, stop, let's argue, and then now you're being accused of you're killing me. These are all very oppressive things to put on somebody else who is literally just trying to go. Now let's talk about nail polish. Suddenly, I'm just getting cl clobbered from behind and, and one's natural primal instinct is to, is to kind of duck and cover. So I ducked and covered, but they didn't stop. I came up this, this like this, sort of protecting my face, but at the same time, with their arms swinging wildly, I put my arms out and I was able to get her into a, a bear hug or something, just to stop her from hitting me anymore. I believe there was some kind of contact with our, our heads, our foreheads. Yeah. As would happen if you're trying to calm someone. Sure. Like that. Um, that was when she uh, accused me of head headbutting her. So we're going to hear a lot about this headbutt, right? I, I let her go. She huffed away and she was gone for about, and she came back about seven or eight minutes later. She had a Kleenex of tissue to her nose. She, then she pulled it away from her nose and she showed it to me. Red. It was indeed like red color on the, on the tissue. Way to go, Johnny. You broke my nose. And I knew I hadn't. So I said, oh my God, let me see. Are you okay? What am happened? I? And she wouldn't let me see anything. And so I waited. She dropped it into the wastebasket in her bathroom and uh, left the room. And then I pulled the Kleenex out of the out of the trash and realized that it was nail polish. Oh my gosh. I don't know if they're gonna be able to prove this, but if they can, she put nail polish on a tissue to fake a bloody nose and claim that he broke it. Well, I remember I was sitting at the table where most of the, the argument, again, escalated, 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 and she simply reached down and grabbed a can of the can of mineral spirits and uh, and uh, chucked it at my face. She threw it at my face and it struck me right at the bridge of the nose. Wow. So the forehead bridge of the nose area. Oh, the way she is staring at him right then and there when he is laughing and it almost looks like he's laughing at, oh my gosh. So we're gonna look at another recording now. This is about the, the bathroom incident where she allegedly kicks a door that hits him in the face. You kicking the the bathroom door and hitting me in the skull as I was bent Again, down. I am Wait, sorry. I was upset. There was a lot Wait, going on okay. and I was in, on an ambient. Okay. Like, why, like, why are you obsessing over the fact that I can't remember it the way you remembered it? I said I was sorry. Okay. I didn't deny I it. That, not... You hear her say I'm sorry, like kind of uh, quietly. In Australia, when we had the big fight where I lost the tip of my finger, at least five bathrooms and two bedrooms I went to. That's to the escape problem. the fight. You don't escape the fight. You escape the solution. No. You escape the solution. No. You s escape figuring it out. We cannot work it out if you run away to the bathroom every time. Listen. There's the manipulation again of someone who's trying to control how somebody operates. And so her justification is he's not escaping, you know, the escalation. He's escaping the solution, which is such a manipulative thing to say. You, you, you can't have a solution if the argument just keeps mounting and mounting and mounting and mounting. I fucking go to the, into the bathroom and sit on the floor. Bam, 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 here you come. I come out, fight, 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 crazy, escalated. I go, I split again, I go to another fucking bathroom or bedroom or something. Knock, 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 bang, bang, bang. You kept coming to get me. Mm, you kept coming to get me. You will not leave me alone. It's relentless. As you said earlier, it's uncontrollable. <sighs> you, you seem to think that there's this cowardice in me that runs away and I don't fight for you. The majority of what these recordings are proving to me is that Johnny is classically known to leave. Him getting out of it is him trying to de-escalate and that is very important and therefore it paints her as the aggressor who keeps coming for him and he keeps trying to leave. Tell Travis what just happened. You oh, you tell me to do it. 
You told me to. You said, go do that. I said, no, I t- tell them what you said. And I lied. And that you punched me in You're the right. fucking thing. And you, you figured it all out. And I, I watched you lie. And then I, I didn't punch you, by then, the way. You, I'm sorry that I didn't uh, you uh, hit you across the face in a proper slap, but I was hitting you. It was not punching you. Babe, you're not punched. Don't tell me what it feels like to be punched. You, you know, you've been a lot of fights. You've been around a long time. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, when you fucking have a close You face. didn't get punched. You got hit. I'm sorry I hit you like this. But I did not punch you. I did not fucking deck you. I fucking was hitting you. I don't know what the po- motion of my actual hand was. But you're fine. I did not hurt you. I did not punch you. I was hitting you. Wow. So she's justifying. I didn't punch you. I was hitting you. I didn't punch you. I was hitting you. Duh. Like, wow. And she knows that she's being recorded when she's saying this. So imagine what might be happening in the instances she's not being recorded. This is going to be a huge problem for Amber's defense. (laughs) Again, let's not forget it's not about the abuse. It's not a criminal trial. It is about the op-ed piece. But she explained herself to be the public figure face of DV. And now you're in recording saying that you hit him. You want to be the poster child. You want to be the one representing DV, honey. As a victim, you do not represent me. That's not a title that you should be christening yourself with. I fucking was hitting you. I don't know what the motion of my actual hand was, but you're fine. I did not hurt you. I did not punch you. I was hitting you. You're just being so dramatic. You didn't get punched. You got hit. Whatever. It's not a big deal. That is exactly what an abuser would say. And imagine if the roles were reversed. Imagine if this was a recording of Johnny saying this to Amber. Amber, you didn't get punched. You were just hit. I, I'm not sitting here bitching about it, am I? You are. That's the difference between me and you. You're a fucking baby. Wow. You're the one bitching about being a victim. You're the one bitching about being hit because you're a baby. That's the difference between me and you. You're a baby. I don't know what the defense is going to be on this, but right now that is sounds 100% like something a very ongoing abuser would say to their victim. You are such a baby. Call the Oh, did you Johnny. Start a physical fights? Wow. I did start a physical fight. Yeah, you did, so I had because, to get the fuck out of there. Yes, you did. So you did the right thing, the big thing. The, you know what? You are admirable. There's so much disdain and sarcasm and belittling in her words. And look how small he is. Look, he is, he is his shoulders are sloped. He is uh, just crumpling. You can see him kind of hugging himself. Mr. Depp, could you please explain to the jury what they just heard on those audio recordings what what was displayed on the audio recordings was um very much the tone aggression attitude need for a fight that 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 was that was a sound that I had gotten you very used to. Again, I'm, we're just hearing one side of it, so opinions can change, but, but that sounds very plausible to me. I, I was in fact taking a shower and she came banging on the door, banging on the door, banging on the door. I didn't answer, I was in the shower. I couldn't deal with it. I didn't want to deal with anymore. So imagine again, flip the situation. Imagine it was a woman in the shower. So she's nude, very vulnerable, and a man bang, bang, bang on the door. Mm. I finally got out of the shower and I opened the bathroom door about that that much just so I could have a, a good hold on the door. She was pushing her all her weight on the door trying to get in. So when I pushing the bathroom door trying to close it she screamed out ow my toes or my foot or something in that second i thought possibly her 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 foot had gotten caught under the door and when i knelt down on my hands and knees to look at her foot to see the injury she kicked uh the bathroom door into my head Uh. so it it, um, she kicked the bathroom door into my head, stood up, and I, the next move was just a bang. It just, uh, she clocked me in the jaw. Mm. That, that, that audio recording was about her uh, trying to make less of what had happened. There it is. That, 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 that right there. You are guaranteeing a fight. 
fight. When you do that, and I've, tell, I've told you this so many times, you guarantee it. if you were interested in not fighting, you would be respectful if you needed the space. You would be careful not to perpetuate the fight longer by saying, I need, I need a few minutes. And then actually honoring that. How can I trust you that it will be a few minutes when you've done this in the past and disappeared for hours? If you want to be the person that's like, I need to cool down, help me do that, give that to you. But I can't give it to you if you always let me down no, and fuck is, up and forget. <laughs> That to me is very, very telling, right? We keep talking about this theme of control. And so when she's saying that like, by you taking time away to, to de-escalate, you're guaranteeing a fight literally like chops the victim off at the at the legs essentially and saying that like, if you want to de-escalate, you're guaranteeing that I'm gonna fight with you. So it's your fault now that we're fighting because you needed to set some boundaries here to protect yourself. That's so twisted. And then she says something very telling to me. She says, if you want to be the person that's like, I need to cool down, help me do that, give that to you. But I can't give it to you if you always let me down and fuck up and forget. Help me give that to you. How can I give you your space? As if it's hers to give in the first place, bitch. You need to help me give that to you. I am the one who controls your time and your space. So if you want me to give that to you, then you need to adhere to my rules. I'm telling you, that will make it worse. No. I guarantee you it will. If you're, if you're stuck in throwing punches. I'm not, not talking about throwing punches. She doesn't say I didn't throw punches. She just says I'm not talking about throwing punches right now. I'm an argument. In arguments, you tend to throw punches. I'm talking about arguments. I'm not talking about the times when it's quite physical. I'm talking about arguments. I firmly believe that she has been physical uh, and violent with him. The, the question ultimately is who who originated the abuse in the relationship in the first place. I, I did some learning on this recently. The United Nations actually has laws about what would be considered uh, abuse or not in those situations because there actually is not a thing called mutual abuse. I know a lot of people want to throw that word around, especially with this case, mutual abuse. It's always about the power dynamic, who has the power dynamic. And in this situation, if Amber was the one one controlling Johnny from the beginning, then she actually has the upper hand. It's very complicated and nuanced, and I wanted to get more into that in another uh, video, perhaps. Split. You take off right away. You don't deal with the issue. You don't deal with the confrontation, and you split. And as she continuously says in these recordings, she is acknowledging that he leaves. When we were on the road, where we would always have to book an extra room that I was able to escape to. Oh my so gosh. I have to lock myself in another bathroom. Can you imagine a situation where when you're booking a hotel room, you got a budget for two hotel rooms every time they travel, just so that Johnny has a place to escape to. She asked me if I would stop drinking to save the relationship, of course. And I stopped drinking. I always found it odd that in support of me not drinking, that she might stop drinking mm. uh, but she did not Ooh. and I, I didn't make a big deal about it in fact i would i would open her wine i would pour her a glass that went on for many many months just in my experiences with friends who have dealt with alcoholism when they uh became sober it could be particularly difficult to be around alcohol or to be around people drinking right and, and so for him to be pouring her alcohol bitch like maybe stop drinking for a little bit i don't know maybe like make a little sacrifice to help him <laughs> in this situation like if i was dating someone who's smoking i don't smoke okay but i I wouldn't be smoking in front of them and being like, you really need to quit smoking, okay? But can you light my cigarette real quick? At that point, I said to her, okay, listen, how about this? You want to, you want to support me not drinking. How about you stop drinking and share this sobriety with me to support me and help me through this? What did she say to that? No. No. It's actually quite sad. This is a text message exchange that you had with Paul Bettany. You text Mr. Bettany, let's burn Amber. Oh, Johnny. Exclamation points, right? You see that? I do see that. You say, let's drown her before we burn her. John! 
Johnny, Johnny, Johnny. Okay, we talked about this, Johnny. Did I read that right? You certainly did, yes. And you wrote that about the woman who would later become your wife. Yes, I did. If Johnny is the true victim here, and again, we haven't heard both sides, but if he is the true victim, and I do think he is a victim of at least some things, then it's not at all uncommon for a victim to sort of take out their frustration, meaning to say terrible things about the abuser. This is his trauma response to the abuse that she has been allegedly afflicting on him. I have thought and said things about my long-term abuse abuser that were not lovely things to say about a person um, and I don't like that place that it's coming out of me but at the same time it's completely understandable. Yes I am ashamed that um, that has to be spread on the uh, on the world like um, peanut butter. <laughs> what? <laughs> For example the text that is about burning Ms. Heard is it's it's a it's directly from Monty Python um, in the sketch about burning witches and then drowning the witches. It's just um, irreverent and abstract humor. Ms. Heard despised uh, Mr. Petney mainly because we had become such close friends. For her, he was a threat. Whenever Mr. Petney tried to make a point, she would talk over him. She got mean and then his 18 year old boy, he entered the uh, conversation because these, this was something to do with what he'd studied. He voiced his opinion. Ms. Heard demeaned that young man to the point of where he, where he, he burst into uh, tears wow. and walked away. That's just unacceptable. Wow. That's, that's some heavy shit. Many of you guys have probably seen this video, but Amber illegally recorded Johnny while he was really angry. I believe he had either just heard some news about his mother and her health, or if this was when he found out um, that he had kind of been taken advantage of by his money manager. And so he's angry about that, but she dips in and films him without him knowing it, I think to make it look like he's being angry at her. <coughs> And in his mind, he's not angry at her. He's angry at some other thing that happened. Yeah, you're right. I just woke up and you were so sweet and nice. We we're not even fighting this morning. All I did was say sorry. Did she said, we're not even fighting this morning. All I did was say sorry. So she apologized for something. Something happened to you this morning? I don't think so. No. At the same time, I don't think that she's scared because she's perfectly fine, willing, and able to record him. Unless she is scared, but she's willing to take that risk. That's the thing. You want to see crazy? I'll give you fucking crazy. Oh, and right there, she knew that he she could get caught, so she swoops her own jug in front of their her phone or whatever's recording to try to hide it. <laughs> But then she swoops it away because she wants the camera to pick up him pouring a glass of wine. Oh, you're crazy. You're crazy. Have you drunk this whole thing this morning? Oh, you got this going. You got this going? Just started it. Oh, really? Really? <laughs> Being legally recorded by your chosen other is well it's quite fitting with the rest of the photographs i thought what, what was most interesting is that she <clears throat> tried to hide it from me and then that she laughed and smiled at the end but so yes you didn't I, I did assault um a couple of cabinets but i did not touch miss Heard. i did assault some cabinets but not her self a um a mega pint of red wine correct a mega pint I poured myself a large glass of wine. Right. I thought it necessary. What 
is what is it that is so important always to run away to? I you asked me once not to leave, and I'm asking you. So why every five seconds do I get I'm leaving because there's a fucking movie party I gotta go to? Again, she's kind of exemplifying to the court in this that Johnny has a history of walking away from arguments. And again, it's another instance of her not letting him leave. Then today it takes you two seconds. It takes you twenty seconds at most to go. I hate you. I don't want to be with you. Goodbye. I'm leaving. I'm running away. It's not running away. It's trying to de-escalate. Then if you don't want to be with me in life, then you need to actually do it. You need to actually take off your ring and forget that five hours ago you said the opposite. Otherwise, you can't keep throwing that around. I believe that was the sound of him taking off his wedding ring and throwing it across the room. <laughs> Ask it, you shall receive. You couldn't imagine your life without me. And now you're throwing your ring on the ground. Does that seem normal? Come here. And you have Please come here. Insult. Please come here. I'm not insulting you. I have not been insulting you. I love you. Johnny, what do you need me to do? I love you. This is so... Mm. It's this flip-flop, right? She goes from like soft-spoken, come here, come here, and then when he doesn't, she's like, come here, what do you mean? And then it's just kind of this explosive, shrill kind of screaming at him. And it's like, how would anybody feel safe in that situation? Stop. I'm smacking in the ear again. I love you. I'm gonna smack my ear again. So fucking, uh, resounds in my fucking cranium. And then you like that? Uh -huh. well, And then she's just going to this, I love you, I love you, just li but like, how would somebody trust that? How is somebody supposed to believe that and not feel manipulated, not feel used or abused or cornered into a situation? I don't love you that much. No, I don't. I do not love you that much. I'm not gonna be that shit, Baby, man. stop. 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 The screeching of her voice demand that things go her way and only her way. I was done. And I think I stated clearly, I don't want to be with you. I don't want to be with you. She said, take your ring off. She still wouldn't let me leave. I did, and she still wouldn't let me leave. She had given me a good chop in the ear, you know. Leaves you ringing, you know. So I thought, maybe this will make you happy. Will that make you stop? Will hitting me again make you happy? Will it make you stop? It's very powerful testimony. I don't know what she was after. I had a, a, a knife in my pocket and I just took the knife out and I said, here, cut me. That's, that's what you want to do. Ultimately, you've taken everything. You want my blood? Take it. Wow. Have my blood. You want it. I know you want it. That's all I've got left. Take it. Because that's psychologically, emotionally where I was. I was at the end. I was broken. I don't know what she was trying to do. So I just thought the only answer is here. Cut me. Mm. Take my blood. Wow. That's all, that's all I've got left to give you. It, it's, it's almost like your soul is just gone. Like you're just nothing at this point. So let's look at the last statements that Johnny made in his testimony and how they closed it out. I don't know how to get my um, reputation back. We write a letter together. So Amber is worried about her reputation. This would be after the restraining order and the publicity behind that. I don't know if she's having regrets, second thoughts about having done that, but now she's worried about her reputation and obviously not Johnny's. Have we had fights in the past? Have we had this or whatever? They already know all that shit, don't matter. Oh, no, it matters. It makes, I, they, I have been, I have, that, you have no idea. Every ounce of my credibility has been taken from, I mean. And Her saying you have no idea, uh, every ounce of credibility has been taken from me. How, how would he not know? His entire credibility was destroyed as well in that moment. The abuse, the abuse thing is, 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 is we've got to deal with that, yeah. We gotta and, deal and with that on you. Any way of my credit is is my credibility. You know what I don't and I, why I, did you put that out there? I said, oh my god, I thought the first time. Amber, I, I wow. lost a f***ing finger, man. Come on. I a mineral can't a jar of a can of mineral spirits thrown on my nose. I, I you can see 
tell people that it was a fair fight and see what the ju- see what the jury and judge think. Tell the world, Johnny. Tell them, Johnny Depp. I, Johnny Depp, man, I'm I'm a victim too of domestic violence, and yes. I, you know, it's a fair fight. And see how many people believe or side with you. That sounds like a threat. Tell the world, Johnny, that I too am the victim of domestic. Tell the world, Johnny, tell the world that I, a man, her pointing out a man, to me underscores that she has an understanding that men are often not believed when it comes to DV. And she knows that and she's weaponizing that against him. So tell the world, Johnny, tell them that you, a man, are also a victim here and see if they believe you. What did you say in response when Miss Heard said, tell the world, Johnny, tell them Johnny Depp, I, Johnny Depp, a man, I'm a victim too of domestic violence. I said, yes, I am. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Tell the world, Johnny, tell the world I, a man, am a victim and see who believes you. And well, here he is telling the world. Let's see if people believe him. Okay, it is time for a little kitty palette cleanser. We have another very sleepy pork chop. Say hi, pork chop. <laughs> uh, first of all, y'all, I am so excited. The new Petty University Spring Summer Apparel is coming very soon. We're gonna have new clothes and new accessories. Ah! you are going to freak out when you see the collection. And the first launch that we did, the freshman collection, might be going away for good. I'm just saying, just saying. You might wanna grab some things if you want some things. <laughs> and as always, please follow me on Instagram and tag me in your outfit so I can repost your Petty University looks. A couple of Twitter shout outs from my Will Smith Chris Rock doc. Now I highly recommend you watch it if you want a totally different perspective. Uh, it's linked below. Uh, first shout out goes to to Liz is Lost, who said, thank you once again for giving us your grace and pettiness on this controversy, always shedding light on aspects most of us don't see or think about. I appreciate these docs you make. Keep up the good work, queen. Thank you so much. Or are we giving the, the nap time struggle? Second shout out goes to Sophia who says, it sucks seeing the pain caused in this situation, but at the same time really proves the double standards on the media and in relationships. Love your work, Swoop, and I hope you have a wonderful but petty day. Thank you so much for your thoughts and support. It means so much to me. If you wanna be my next Twitter shout out, make sure to follow me on Twitter, linked below and retweet this video right here. Also hit me up on Instagram. That's where I post most often. All right, Pork, you wanna say goodbye? You wanna say goodbye? Baby, baby. Be sure to check out ExpressVPN and get three months free by tapping my link in the description or go to expressvpn.com swoop and enjoy all your favorite new shows. So I know just how complex this entire Johnny Depp Amber Heard case is and how challenging it can be to navigate who is telling the truth, who is the real victim, and how do we not invalidate victims. I, and, and I don't think that we'll ever get all of those answers ultimately. Like Johnny and Amber are the ones who know and even then memories can get distorted. Now as we go through and cover more of this case, I hope that we can keep in mind that there are like no angels here. I don't, I don't think either one of them are blameless. I don't know that anyone's going to monetarily win this case because at the end of the day everyone has already lost something But I do hope that this shines a light on the importance of believing male victims I hate to think that men are inherently lost in that conversation so often and I hope that Johnny and Amber Ultimately get the help that they individually need and that this trial in some ways Encourages more survivors to tell their stories when they're ready and doesn't discourage them But we will just have to see day by day what happens. And you know what? Y'all got this. Class dismissed. Swoop!